Praise the name of the Lord. We love you, Jesus. We worship and thank you. And Father, I thank you for your presence with us right now as we dive into your word. I pray, Father, that you would anoint every one of us to listen and to hear what the Spirit is saying to us today. And Father, I also give you thanks that you're with every person that's watching and listening to this in time and in space. And that, Holy Spirit, you're opening our hearts to hear and our ears to listen, not just to the words that I speak, to what your Spirit is saying to us today. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Praise the name of the Lord. God bless you and welcome. It is good to have you with us, Abundant Life family and those that are tuning in or watching or listening, wherever you are, we are gathered in his name and the Lord has a word for us today. You know, we've been talking about uh, on Sundays and in our Wednesday night deep dives about living in this time we call the last days. The Bible has so much to say about what it's going to be like to live in this moment that we're in right now. And in the scripture, there's specific wisdom on what we need to do to live in the time that we're encountering all around us right now. And this wisdom is important because we have to activate it and walk in it. And of course, I'm going to start by looking at this passage in the book of 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5. In 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5, the Apostle Paul had just written to the believers in Thessalonia about the rapture of the church or the catching away, that there's coming a day when Jesus is going to come back and he's going to raise all of those who have died in him. And those of us who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord, he's going to catch us up together and we are going to meet the Lord in the air. This is a promise of the word of God and it's called in scripture, the blessed expectation or the blessed hope. We need to expect this to happen because it gives us hope and comfort when we're in difficult times. Then Paul switches over and begins to talk about how you need to be living and thinking as you see this day approaching. And so he said, concerning the times and the seasons of the Lord's return, you don't need that I write you. You don't need for me to write you all about when is it going to happen and what season is it going to be in? Because he said, you yourselves know that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. So he's saying, listen, when this really happens, the fullness of this, you need to know that it's going to be difficult and there's going to be a judgment that's going to come upon those who, who have refused to follow the Lord. And uh, everybody will think it's fine. They're going to say peace and safety, everything is well, and then these events are going to come to pass. But he, he, he contrasts that. I don't want you to focus on the judgment or on the, the sudden destruction because that's not Paul's intention. What Paul is trying to say is not there's terrible things coming in the future. What Paul is saying is this, in spite of what is happening in the world at any given moment, and we're, we've dealt with persecution and challenges for 2,000 years since Jesus walked the earth, and in spite of what's going to be in the earth when the Lord does come, that we need to keep a mindset that we are not appointed to the same kind of thing that those who don't follow the Lord are appointed to. That we, God has a different plan for us. Now this isn't to say that God doesn't care about the people that are in the world or the people that, that are going to be present when he returns and, and experience these terrible things. He does care and that's why we're here, the church of Jesus Christ. Because God is stretching out his hands right now to every person, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every culture, every race, every nation, every religion, Jesus came to save the whole world. And his hands are reaching out right now to everyone. And he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We're living in the time before the Lord's coming. We call it the great day or year of the Lord's favor. God has favor for every person 
if they'll come to him in the name of Jesus, if they'll approach God by accepting the gift of his son Jesus in this time, God will not only forgive them of their sin, but he'll bring them out of that judgment that our sins have placed us in and put us in a different track for a different destiny. And so Paul is saying, listen, about all these things, when the Lord comes, there's going to be trouble on the earth. But he said, God has not appointed these things to be your experience. You are sons of the light and sons of the day. We're not of the night or the darkness. The night in this case would represent the period of time where that terrible, the worst of that terrible destruction comes. But he said, you're not in the night, you're in the day still, and you're people of the day. So you need to stay awake because you're in the daytime. You need to be focused on what God has called for you. He said, therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. So he said, we aren't supposed to fall asleep. You know, you can fall asleep when you ought to be awake. And the Lord is saying in the last days, you need to stay awake. You need to be aware of what's happening around you. You need to be aware of the promises of God. He said, let us stay sober. That means clear headed and let us stay fully awake. And he goes on to say in verse, uh, in verse 8, but let us who are of the day be sober. So I just want you to say this if you're studying along with us. Say, just point to yourself and say, let us who are of the day. That's us. We're day people. We're light people. Okay? Let us who are of the day be sober. This word means clear-headed. So say, Let us be clear-headed. Now, this word clear-headed means this is what you need to focus your mind on. Since we're of the day, this is how we need to be thinking. These are the things that we need to be very clear about. And here it is, that we are protected by the armor of faith and love. And wearing as our helmet the confidence of, of our salvation. Notice he said we're protected. So God in this time where there's trouble on the earth, he wants our minds to be focused not on the trouble, but on the promise that we have armor. Armor protects you. And that armor that protects the believer in the last days from the things that come upon the world is the armor of faith. That means we have to learn what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. We've got to learn how to pray and believe for things. We've got to learn how to stand against things in faith. And he said, faith and love. Love is a protection. And then he said, the helmet of salvation or the hope of your deliverance. Now, I want to focus again on that word, uh, faith and love. Love is so important. It is, we've been talking about it, it is an essential element of your and my protection in the last days. One of the things that Satan wants to do in all of our lives is to get us out of love. He wants to move us out of a place where we're walking in the revelation of God's love. Now, the love of God is manifested in this, we call this the great commandment or commandments. And Jesus taught it. He said that first is that we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We love God. We could put it this way. We love God, and because we love God, and because we know he loves us, we love ourselves. And because we love God, and we're loved by God, and we love ourselves, we now are in a position to love other people. And that is powerful. You see, the love of God is not just something that you express towards him. But the Bible says before, while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you and me. God loved us and gave us salvation in Christ. The Bible says before the foundation of the world, God set his love upon us. So the loving God isn't just about you in your own strength saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. Yes, we need to love God. But our love towards God is a response to the revelation that he first loved us. The love of God is living in the light that God loves me. Me, you, 
though we're unworthy, though we have fallen many times, though we, are, uh, we offer God nothing, we can't, we can't bring to God our perfect life because we haven't had perfect lives, we come to God just as we are. And God says, I love you. And being saved is really first receiving the love that God has for you, believing it. You've got to believe it that God loves you so much that he sent Jesus to the cross to take out of the way the thing that blocks God's love relationship with us, which is our own sin. That Jesus took our sin and the punishment for all of our sins so that God could lay our sin on Jesus and take Jesus' righteousness and give it to us. That's what it means to be a Christian. Being a Christian isn't because I've I've agreed to a moral code and now I'm a Christian as long as I keep doing these things. Being a Christian is coming into a place where you have accepted the great gift of God, Jesus, that he paid for your sins. And and because God loves you, and now that you believe that he loves you, now you become a person of infinite worth. You love God back because he first loved you. And now yourself If you're loved by God, then who are you to hate what God loves? You see, we've got to accept the love that God has for us. We've got to believe that God loves us, in spite of the fact that we're not all there yet, that we still stumble in our flesh, that we have thoughts in our mind that that our new nature resents, that sometimes we say and do things that are just absolutely not right. But in spite of that, not because of it, in spite of it, God paid the price for us to be fully delivered, and we're, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we're on a journey learning how to get free from those things so that we can act in, our, in the real world according to the love that God has for us. And when you really love yourself, because God loves you, and you've accepted God's love, you're in the best position to love other people. And sin, really, if we could define it all by one thing, sin is in some way a violation of the love of God. It is, the, love is, the love of God is the primary principle on which the whole kingdom of God operates. We've got to love him, we've got to believe he first loved us, and we have to love ourselves and love one another as he loves us. And so these principles are powerful. Now, one of the things that blocks us, and it keep, by the way, it keeps us safe from the enemy, who's constantly looking to accuse us and to attack us, and to steal, kill, and destroy from us the victory that Jesus purchased for us. And if we're going to live in the favor of God, we're going to have to be people that live in love. And love is an armor. It is a protection. It keeps us safe. So part of that protection is the principle of forgiveness. Forgiveness is when we extend to someone else a release from their offense that they've committed that has offended us. Uh, Forgiveness is something that we extend to someone else when we release them from the consequence, the personal feeling of vengeance that we have for their offense against us. Forgiveness is such a powerful concept in the Bible, that the Bible has a lot of words to describe it. And so I'm going to take some time to talk to you about this because I believe one of the things that are the greatest barriers to our being safe and protected in this time is for the devil to get us out of God's love, to either get us to doubt his love for us, to get us to to, uh, become uh, uh, unaccepting of ourselves so, so that we then turn around and we are unaccepting of other people. If he can get us out of love, especially out of love as it relates to walking in love with people who've hurt us, then we have opened a door for the enemy to really come into our lives and to attack us. And our faith will not work without love. So we have to walk in love. And if we're going to walk in love, we're going to have to learn to walk in forgiveness. Forgiveness is absolutely essential. Now, in James chapter 2, the apostle James said this, He said, yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. This is the royal law, love your neighbor as yourself. And once again, you can't love others until you love yourself, and you can't really love yourself until you know that you're loved by God and have received his love for you. And once you've accepted the love of God and his forgiveness, now that's how you need to live 
towards your neighbor. It's the royal law. And he goes on in verse 12 and he says, so whatever you say and whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. The law that sets you free. You see, when we are born again or we ask God's forgiveness, it is the law of love that sets us free. It liberates us from the consequences that would normally be ours for breaking God's law. And so he says, he said, you need to live and act whatever you say and do according to people that will be judged not by the law of God's holy commands that we've broken, but we're going to be judged by the law of liberty, which is the law of love that has made us free. And the only way we can be free is because the Lord has forgiven us of our sins. Verse 13, he said, therefore, there will be no mercy for those who've not shown mercy to others. But if you have a merciful heart, God will be merciful when he judges you. What is he saying? He's saying the way you want God to treat you when it comes to forgiveness and love is the way you need to assess and treat others. So if you want to walk in forgiveness, you have to be a forgiver. And God wants us to be proactive in staying in a place of love and forgiveness. Now, to say that forgiveness is essential to the, to the Christian life is, is, is uh, almost unnecessary. It is, the, it is the currency of the Christian life. We begin our life in God, not by approaching him with all the things we've accomplished, but approaching him with the fact that we know that we have, we're broken and fallen people. We begin the Christian life with an acknowledgement of our own failure our own weakness, our own human sin. And at the same time, we bring to that acknowledgement faith. Faith that God, who already knew about our sin, has provided an answer in Jesus. That God, even before we arrived on this planet, saw us and knew us and put our sins on Jesus, his son on the cross, and paid the price. So when we begin our Christian life, we come with a recognition that we can't save ourselves, that we are in trouble, and with faith that God made a way for those sins to be paid for. And when we bring those two things together, the Bible says that God saves us. He reaches down into our heart and takes out that old sinful nature. And he takes all of our sins and he throws them behind his back. He, he separates sin from us, the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west. And he makes us, by his Holy Spirit, a child of God. And that's how we begin. We begin by receiving something we haven't earned, we haven't deserved, we haven't worked for. It's given to us because of God's mercy. And I, I love this. I want to read this passage, Psalm 103. It says in verse 2, to bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Don't forget all of his benefits, who forgives all of our iniquities and heals all of our diseases. In verse 8, it says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor keep his anger forever. He's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Folks, you need to live in these verses until you believe them. Because when you believe them, you're not going to walk around in guilt and shame. You're going to walk around with thanksgiving and joy and peace. Now, once you have that revelation, God says, now turn it around and give it to others. Sow it towards others. Be merciful because you've received mercy. And that requires us to forgive people, not on the basis of their performance, or on the basis of their even requesting forgiveness. We don't forgive people on the basis of their changed behaviors. We forgive people on the basis of the fact that we have been forgiven by God and it's the one debt we owe him is to not hold other people's sins against them. That doesn't mean they're gonna get away with their sins because any sin that isn't dealt with by repentance and trust and faith in God will be there will be consequences in this life and in the next. But it's not our place as forgiven sinners to take God's place 
in meeting out or withholding forgiveness from someone else. And this is not an easy thing to do. Because sometimes the people that hurt us the most are the people that we love. The people that are close to us. The people sometimes in our own families, our own, our own friend circle. Sometimes in our own communities, our church communities, our workplace. Sometimes the people we trust the most are the people that uh, can do and say things intentionally or unintentionally that are the most hurtful. And when I talk about forgiveness, I'm not saying that we try to cover what someone has done, cover up what someone has done, and whitewash it and pretend that what happened wasn't, wasn't real or that they didn't do it. Because then you're pretending that sin isn't sin. No, if somebody has sinned against you or hurt you, that's a real fact. But it's how you deal with that fact that's important. First of all, you've got to realize, and I, I, we all have to realize this, that, that people are going to do things against us, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes intentionally. Jesus said it's impossible for offenses not to come. We will get offended. It's just going to happen, living in this world. And, and then second of all, we need to realize that it's, it's, a, a, there are consequences for people's sins, and they will experience those consequences if they don't get under the mercy of God. I want to say that also forgiveness does not mean that I, I have to trust you on the same level that maybe I trusted you before. Forgiveness and trust are not the same things. I can forgive you, but if you want my trust, you're going to have to earn it. There's some things you're going to have to do. Maybe I'll give you the opportunity to earn that trust. Uh, forgiveness also doesn't mean that I have to have a close, personal, intimate relationship with the person that's offended me for the rest of my life. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do is to put some distance between you and offending people. Uh, it's sometimes easier to walk in love when you're not actually seeing the offensive person all the time. The other thing is that sometimes we have to hold boundaries, and that is loving. Sometimes the most loving thing we can do with people in our lives that are, are caught up in something that's hurting us is we have to let them experience those consequences, but not bring the consequences like we're going to make them change. That's God's role. The key is, and this is the key I want you to capture, that we don't let the rot of their, their actions, words, unmet expectations sit in our heart and corrupt us. Because if we start holding anything against someone else, regardless of what they did, it actually impacts our walk with God. It impacts our faith. And it Actually, what it does, it's the flesh's way of trying to make something right. But as a Christian, we have to make sure that it's God who is the one that's changing another person, not us through our vengeance or through our efforts to, to, try, to, uh, to try to hold people in such a way that they feel and experience the pain that we felt. And that's a very human thing for us to do. But God says we need to forgive fully and freely, even as he's forgiven us in the exact same way. And so how do you do that? How do you forgive somebody uh, and let it go so that it's not bothering you anymore? And I want to give you some really practical ways to do that. And I want to do that by looking at the word forgiveness. Now, in the Bible, there are several different words. The Bible was written in Hebrew and Greek, and there's several different words in the Old Testament and the New Testament that are all translated the same in English. They're all translated forgive. But each one has a little bit of a different meaning. In the Old Testament, there's this passage in 1 Chronicles 21.8. And David said to God, I have sinned greatly by taking the census. This was a particular event that David uh, disobeyed what God had said in his word and took a, a census out of the pride of his heart. And David said, please forgive my guilt for doing this foolish thing. He said, God, I've sinned, forgive me. Now, the word he uses for forgive is the word abar, abar, and it means to pass over and not count, to pass over and not count. You know, when we're in a relationship with someone, if you're in a marriage relationship, a dating relationship, you just have to realize this. There are going to be a whole lot of things you just have to abar. You've just got to pass over. If you're going to hold everything your wife does wrong in your eyes against her, you're going to be miserable in marriage. And if every time your husband forgets something or doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, love you the way that you want to be loved, 
um, if you're going to hold that, if you're going to hang on to that, you're going to be miserable in marriage. Because the reality is people that we love and live with will disappoint us. And there's a whole lot of things in life we just need to abar. We just need to pass over them. We just need to say, you know what? It's not worth it. It's not something that I'm going to hold. I'm just going to let this go. Now, David really did sin. What he did was wrong. But David said, God, don't count this against me. Abar me. Lord, pass this over me. Just just pass over this. And that's a way to pray, Lord, I know this is wrong, but I need you to just cover this. And so we can pray that way for ourselves like David did, but we need to pray that way for other people. There are times that people will sin in ways that are hurtful to us, and we're not saying it wasn't hurtful or wrong, but we're going to say, Lord, I'm going to ask you to pass over this. I'm going to ask you to, because they need you right now. They need your mercy and your love. So there's the idea of just passing over. I'm not going to hold on to this. I'm not going to keep an account and a record of every little thing. You know, if you're trying to keep an account of every time somebody uh, does what you uh, does something good or every time somebody uh, doesn't meet your expectations or does it wrong, you're going to be miserable because you're going to have people on lists, good lists and bad lists. And then you'll have sub lists of where they wronged you and where they righted you. Did you know that's a miserable way to live? It's a horrible way to live. And and so you've got to pass over things. Now, there's another word for forgive in the Old Testament, and it's found in Psalm 2511. It says this, for the honor of your name, O Lord, forgive my many, many sins. Forgive my many, many sins because it gives glory to your name. The word uh, forgive here is the Hebrew word salach or salach, and it means to pardon, to pardon, to lift off and set aside. This is very different. So when David is praying, Lord, forgive my many, many sins, he's saying, these sins are a burden to me. Lord, pardon them, lift by lifting them up and setting them aside. And so sometimes in our forgiveness of others, what we need to do, even if there's many, many sins, we need to not only pass over, but we need to help lift up that burden of guilt and set it aside. We're going to say, I'm not going to hold this over your head. I'm going to set this aside, and I'm going to pardon this. I'm just not going to carry the weight of what you've done. Whether you change or not isn't, isn't predicated upon my choice to forgive. I'm going to lift this off. And sometimes when people are really struggling with many, many sins, they need people to come alongside and not just point out how wrong they were, but to help them bear the weight of it to help them lift the weight of this sin off and, and help them to set it aside. That can, that can mean sometimes we need people to come into our lives to be accountable uh, to us or, or with whom we can be accountable that can talk to us about our many, many weaknesses and failures that will, that will help us bear up under the pressure of our past and won't constantly remind us of all the things we did wrong, but will remind us of the mercy and the grace of God and all the things he's done right so that we can live a better life. In Psalm 103, he uses this word, salach. He says, he forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. That means he lifts them up and sets them aside. In Jeremiah 33, 8, the prophet said, I will cleanse them of their sins against me and forgive all their sins of rebellion. In other words, they have sinned rebelliously, but I'm going to lift those up and I'm going to set them aside and pardon them. It's not, there's nothing like having sin lifted off you and set aside. And I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes we need to do this for people. Sometimes people have sinned against us. They, have, uh, they owe us something. They're under the weight of what they have done wrong. They feel it. And what we need to do is let them know, listen, I forgive you. And, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm not holding this against you. That's under the blood of Jesus. Sometimes we need to say that to one another because we're helping to lift off the weight of their guilt and setting it aside, just like God does for us. In uh, Genesis 50 and verse 17, we find another word for forgive. And the scripture said, please forgive your brothers for the great wrong they did to you, for their sin in treating you so cruelly. So we, the servants of God, the God of your father, beg you to forgive our sin. And when Joseph received this message, he broke down and wept. This is when Joseph's brothers realized that what they had done by selling him into slavery uh, in Egypt and all of the horrible things they had done decades before, uh, the weight of that came upon them. 
And what did they do? They didn't justify it. They didn't say, well, Joseph, you were annoying little brother who was always bragging. No, they said, please forgive us for the great wrong we did to you. And we beg you to forgive our sins. Now, the word forgive that's used twice here is the Hebrew word nasa, which means to bear away. In this case, it doesn't just mean to lift off and set aside. It means to lift it up and take it away. Just take it away from me. Remember the passage we just read, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he's removed our sins from us. Sometimes in forgiveness, we need to realize God has not just lifted off our sins, but he put them on Jesus, and Jesus took them away. And and when he died on the cross, and they will never come back. They are gone forever. It's an awesome thing to know that your sins aren't just being held against you, but they're literally gone and wiped away. Now, there's a fourth word in the Old Testament for forgive, and we find it in Psalm 79 and verse 9. It says, help us, O God of our salvation. Help us for the glory of your name. Save us and forgive us our sins for the honor of your name. This is another Hebrew word. It's the Hebrew word kafar, and it means kafar, and it means to cover, to atone, and to satisfy the claim to satisfy the claim. This is a powerful word to atone. It means that sometimes when a person is guilty, they need someone else to actually pay the price that they cannot pay. This is exactly what God did for us in Jesus. God didn't just say, I forgive you because I'm a forgiving God. He actually punished your sins and my sins. He did what was just, but he did it in the cross. God punished or laid upon Jesus the sin of us all. Our sins do have consequences, and they were paid for by the Son of God. That's why we need to worship and follow Jesus, because he's the one that took the punishment that brings us peace, as the prophet Isaiah said. He took the punishment, the chastisement that brings us peace. Jesus took our sins and he paid the price. That means literally you're going to pay the debt that someone else owes. So forgiveness sometimes means I'm not only going to release you from what you owe me, but I'm going to pay the debt that you can't pay. I'm actually going to help you to make it up. This is a powerful, powerful part, kafar. It's a powerful part of forgiveness. You know, I heard recently about a a particular uh, woman who had a child, and that child was killed by a gangbanger. He was driving through the neighborhood, and uh, he was filled with anger and hostility. He was uh, a drug abuser, and uh, he was dared to kill any young child that he saw to be accepted in the gang. So he shot this this little boy, and this boy died, and, and the mother of this boy was heartbroken. It was her only son. She was absolutely devastated. And, and in the process of this, she was a Christian, and she, in her agony, felt the Lord tell her to forgive him. And so when they went to court, and she got to stand up and talk about what his crimes had done, because he was found guilty, uh, she said, I forgive you, and I know that God loves you. And she began witnessing to him, and she said to the judge, I'd ask you, that you would be merciful to him and that you'd be lenient for him. And I ask you that he would not pay the price because Jesus has paid the price for his sin. So basically, she gave a testimony in court. Well, long story short, this young man spent some time, uh, some, some time in prison. And this woman came every day to the prison. Not every day, but every week she came to the prison and she would visit him. She would treat him like her own son. This is a mother who's child, her only child was killed by this kid. She treated him like her own son. This young criminal's parents didn't know enough to visit. They didn't care. But the woman whom he'd offended came every day and cared for him. When he was remediated or let go from prison, she was there to pick him up. She took him to her own home. She put, his clo- she put clothes on him. She fed him. She literally, and it was a dangerous thing to do. This young man was so broken by this that he, he cried out to God and God saved him. 
And then he went on to become, he, he went in and got his GED, went on to get his education, went on to get a career, and went on to become a coach and a motivator that would speak to other people about the power of love. Because the woman not only forgave him for what he did against her, but actually helped to carry and restore him. She actually paid the price that he was supposed to pay. She helped him along the way. She invested in him. That is a powerful act of forgiveness. Chafar, to atone for someone else's sins because they can't satisfy the legal claims against themselves. In the New Testament, there's several different words for forgive as well. And in the Greek, it's very interesting. In Matthew 6, 12, Jesus taught us to pray this way. And Father, forgive us our sins, even as we forgive those who've sinned against us. The word translated sins is the word that can also be translated debts. So you could read it this way. Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. Because when we sin against somebody, we owe them something, right? And so he's saying, Father, forgive us for our debts. Now, this Greek word, aphemi, means to separate from and send away. So it's actually a prayer. Lord, separate these things from me and send them away. Just separate me from these sins so that they no longer are, I'm living under the shadow of them any longer. And just as you're going to separate from me all of my sins, I am going to turn around and separate everyone else who sinned against me. In other words, if I expect God to push my sins away so I'm not living in the shadow of them, then the Bible says, Father, forgive us even as we forgive. In the same way, we're going to separate people's offenses. The sins that they've committed against us, we're going to push them away. When we see them, we're not going to see the sin that they committed between us and them. We're going to push that out of the way and see them as forgiven children of God. That's what Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer. And we should pray that prayer on a regular basis. You know, uh, nearly every day, I whisper that prayer. I say, and when I get to that part, I say, Father, forgive me my sins, even as I choose today to forgive everyone who sinned against me. Lord, anyone who has done something that was hurtful and offensive, I separate that away from them, and I see them as valuable children of God, changing them what you want changed, but I'm not going to hold their sins against them. Why do I do that? Because I don't want God to see my sins. Uh, He separated them from me. See, really what happens is when you start holding other people's sins, that's a sin. So now the one sin, the one sin that God, that blocks the forgiveness of God is when you hold other people's sins. That's why if you want to be forgiven and live in total grace, you've got to be totally gracious with other people and pray for them. There's a second Greek word for forgive, and it's found in Ephesians 4.32. My oldest brother, Scott, who went to be with the Lord, this was his favorite verse of Scripture. It's written on his, on his tombstone, and, that's, and it says this, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. Be kind and tenderhearted to each other forgiving one another. Now, this is powerful. How do we forgive each other? Even as or in the same way that God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. How did God forgive us? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While the men that were, 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 had beaten, abused, and crucified Jesus were watching his blood fall on the ground as he bled out, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They weren't repenting, but he said, forgive them. So you've got to be like Jesus if you're going to follow Jesus. I mean, you've got to pray, God, forgive them, even when they're still living in the sin and actively committing it against you. Father, forgive them. They're out of their minds. They're deceived by the devil. They're doing this because they don't see clearly. So I'm not going to hold it against them. I forgive them. This is the Christian way. This word to forgive even as God forgave us, is the word charizomai, and it literally means to bestow or give grace. To give grace. The word grace in the Bible, it's a big word, but grace isn't this passive kind of 
God's going to overlook things. Grace is a force. Grace is the ability of God coming into our lives. And once God's ability comes into our lives, he helps us to be what we couldn't otherwise be, to do what we couldn't do on our own. And he helps us to, to live a life we couldn't otherwise live. The grace of God empowers us to live, to be, to do what we couldn't on our own. It's God actually giving us the ability to live a life that pleases him. And the Bible says that we need to not just pass over and separate away people's sins, but we need to give grace to them. And by giving grace, we empower them to change. You know, sometimes the most powerful thing you can give somebody is the grace of God. You pray for God's grace to come into their lives, for God's loving kindness and mercy to manifest in their lives. And when you do that, and when you're gracious to people that are undeserving of it, there's something powerful that happens. Something powerful that happens in your life. You give them power, and you become more powerful. Remember this, when you, when you give grace to somebody, you're not making them more powerful and yourself less powerful. There's nothing more difficult, humanly speaking, and more empowering than making the choice to be gracious to someone who has not been gracious to you. When you choose to pardon or forgive, you are actually taking the control of your own life and heart. You're actually saying, my heart was not designed to be a kettle of filth. My heart was not designed to be a place where I keep the score of everybody that's hurt me because I can't possibly do that and walk in the love of God. So Father, since you're the judge and you judge everyone perfectly and you will hold everybody accountable in the way that is perfect and only you can do this, I'm going to surrender revenge. I'm going to surrender you know, playing their sins back and forth in my mind. I'm going to surrender waiting for them to make it right. I'm going to give that to you. And as a gift to me, I'm going to separate their sins from me. I'm going to free myself from this bondage of unforgiveness and bitterness. Because when you're in unforgiveness, you actually chain yourself to the person that you're not forgiving. You're actually chained to them. You're not free. It haunts you every day. So when you choose to give grace, you're breaking that, and you're not saying it's okay. You're not saying it didn't happen. You're not pretending it was no big deal. It was a big deal. It wasn't okay. It did happen, but you're not going to be the judge. You're going to do something even more powerful. You're going to let God judge it, and you're going to move on in joy because whatever the devil has taken from you through the actions of others, the Lord can restore to you sevenfold. Your faith is in your future. You're not fixed on your past and the sins of other people. Because the moment you do that, you get stuck spiritually. Your faith dwindles. Your hope begins to vanish away. Finally, there's one last word for forgive that I want to share with you. Please listen to this. In Luke 6, 37, Jesus said, judge not and you'll not be judged. Condemn not, and you'll not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Then he said this in the next verse. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give to your life or bosom? Because with the same measure that you give, it will be given back to you. Now, when we quote Luke 6, 38 in church, we often do it in relationship to an offering. Give and it will be given to you. And that is true. And that is, it's true financially. It's true when it comes to anything that we give. God will get it back to us. But in context, this verse is not talking about so much strictly money giving. It's talking about giving forgiveness, giving mercy instead of judgment. Judge not, and you will not be judged. What is he saying? Give mercy and not judgment. Condemn not, and you'll not be condemned. Don't talk about all the things they did wrong. Don't condemn them. Just, just be silent about it. And then he said, forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Because when you choose to forgive, it comes back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. The more you walk in the forgiveness of God towards others, the more you feel the forgiveness of God in your own life.
And the more forgiven you know you are, the less bound you are. One of the reasons we keep stumbling into sin is because we feel guilty. And that guilt drives us into shame. And that shame causes us to, to, to run back to something, some lower thing to try to appease that sense of shame. And we get into this cycle. But when we walk in the mercy and the love of God, we know God loves us. Then we, the devil doesn't have the hook of shame to get us flowing back into repetitive patterns, false idols that don't help us. That's why forgiveness is so powerful. It sets you free. It liberates you. Now, we've looked at seven words for forgiveness in the Old and New Testaments. One means to pass over. Another means to lift up and set aside, to pardon. Another means to remove by bearing it away. Another means to cover the debt by satisfying it and paying for it. Another means to separate it as far from you as possible. Another word means to give grace to it, to give grace to it. And in Luke 6, 37, the word forgive is the Greek word aphesis, and it means to release, to let go, and to dismiss. This is a different picture. It literally means let go. And I want to close our message on this thought. When you forgive, you let go. There's something about holding on to the memories and actively thinking about what people have done to hurt us that actually keeps us clinging to their sin, keeps us hanging on. But when we really forgive, we get to a place where we let it go. Now, letting it go doesn't mean pretending anything. We don't let it go into the air. We let it go to the Lord. If there is anyone in the universe that knows it all, that sees every aspect of a person's failure and sin, it's God. If there is anyone who is holy enough and perfect enough to judge the sin of another person, it's God. And if there's anyone that's powerful enough to hold somebody accountable for the things that they refuse to change in such a way that they not only experience the consequences of their behavior, but they also do it in a way that is absolutely righteous, it's God. Only God can deal this stuff out in perfect form. So when we forgive Apulo, we release, we let go. I'm not hanging on to this anymore, this memory. I'm not going to keep talking about this. I'm letting this go to God, not into the air, to God. And I'm going to let him, and I, and I can be joyful because now, if I know God, it's in his hands. If they, if, if they don't change, they're going, God's going, they're going to get it. They're going to get whatever is righteously coming because of the result of their sin. But I'm going to let it go and pray for them because if they'll turn to the Lord and God changes their heart, then, then they don't have to experience the full consequence. See, if we really knew what it was like to pray for someone to experience the consequence of their sins fully, uh, and we knew what that would feel like, we'd be very merciful to other people. Because the truth is, we all need mercy. Whether we recognize it openly or not, we all need it. So what God is saying to us is this. He's saying, when it comes to other people's sins, you've got to let it go. Let it go, not into the netherworld. Let it go to God. Let Jesus take it. And you turn around and you do this. You pray for them, you bless them, and you do something good for them. The greatest way to keep out of bitterness is to actively pray for the person that's hurt you. After you've let their thing go, you pray for them. God, change with them what you want changed. I pray, Father, for you to be merciful and help them to see what they need to see. Let God figure that out. And then you you need to not only pray for people, but you need to do good to them. Find something good you can do. Something good that maybe they don't deserve it, but do something for them that they don't expect. Not to manipulate them as a way to keep your heart clear. Send them an anonymous gift. Pay a bill for them. You don't even have to let them know it came from you. Just do it for your own sake. Do good to those who despitefully use you and persecute you, the Bible says. And then finally, pray, do good. This third thing, so important, bless those who curse you. 
That means people are going to continue to speak curses sometimes. They're going to speak against you. That's painful. It's difficult. I don't always deal with it well myself. But the Bible tells us, what do you do when someone curses you? Don't curse them back. You bless them. The word bless, eulageo, means to speak well of. You say something good about that person. If you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all. Many times in life, she says, what do you think about so-and-so did? What do you think about this? And I'll say, well, you know, I don't know. Love them, wish them well. There's nothing else I can say, you know? Uh, And then sometimes people want to get you involved in being offended at someone else. If they're not present, just say, you know what? They're not here and I don't know the whole story, and, and, and right now, I don't think this is something, you know, this isn't something that I need to hear right now. I'll pray with you and for you, but I, I, I really don't want to get involved in all of this. Sometimes you just have to realize your spirit and your spiritual love walk is your protection. And sometimes you just have to be bold with people, and they might get offended at you and just say, listen, I can't go there with your offense. This isn't mine to hear the person you're offended at, they're supposed to hear it according to the Bible. So I, I don't want to hear it. I wasn't there. I love you. I'm not judging you. I just don't want to be a part of this. And, and you know what? There's something about that. It's liberating. It's liberating. There's so many things we don't have to have an opinion about. There's so many things we don't have to comment on. There's so many things that we can just let God deal with. And we need to get used to guarding our hearts in love. Anytime we're in a conversation or we're doing or watching or or, or thinking about anything that's causing us to get angry, offended, lose our peace, we need to stop and say, okay, I need to back up from here. This is not helpful. Lord, do you want me to be involved in this? Is this something you want me to think about, talk about? Will my thoughts or my actions do anything to make it better? Does me knowing this change it? If the answer is no, just say, it's nothing to me. I love you, but I have a short leash with the Lord. Yeah, whatever you need to do to stay in love. If your social media gets you all hopped up in anger and bitterness, delete your accounts. It's better to stay in love and not know what everybody's saying than to follow everybody on your feeds and uh, feel offended all the time. It's better to walk in love and not know the whole story, or what at least the presentation is, than it is to feel like you've got to know everything and then deal with offense. Just stay unoffended, because when you do, you're in the best position to hear the voice of God, to stand in faith and experience the blessing of the Lord, and most importantly, you're going to walk in the favor of God, because you're not holding sins against anyone else. God can keep pouring his favor, his love, his blessing upon you. It just keeps coming. The moment you start holding or meditating on somebody else's stuff, whether it's your mother, your father, your friend, your brother, your sister, a co-worker, the moment you start hanging on, guess what? You're, you're starting to block off the grace of God. Let it go in Jesus' name. I hope this message has been a blessing to you. I hope it's fed you. And I pray that God will give you the grace, give us the grace to walk in unconditional forgiveness in Jesus' mighty name. Father, help us. Help us, Lord, to release all those who've sinned against us. Not release them Lord, in a way that's unjust, but to release them to your justice, to have faith that you are able to keep the books, and that, Father, at the end, everyone, every sin will be paid for, either by the blood of Jesus or by a person's own accountability. And so, Father, we pray that you'll be merciful to all those who have sinned against us, just as you have been merciful to us. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you so much. God bless you. Have an incredible day in Jesus Christ. Thanks again for joining us today for service. And don't forget, you can connect with us throughout the week by downloading our app, listening to our podcast, or visiting our YouTube channel. 
And whether you're new to Abundant Life or you've been coming for a while and you just want to learn more about our ministry, you can text the word NEXT to 315-888-5332 and we'll get you connected to all the ways that you can grow deeper in your faith and discover what's next for you here at Abundant Life. And if God has impacted your life through this ministry, we invite you to partner with us financially to continue to help us to reach people throughout the world and our community. Head on over to alcclife.org slash give or use the giving tab on our app and choose the best giving option that works for you. Thanks again for joining us today and we pray that you continue to experience a more abundant life this week.